Welcome to Document Design. Today we're going to move away from focusing on the content of your documents and into the format of them. The way your document looks is a form of nonverbal communication and just like the way you look, oh, the way a document looks can send a lot of messages before someone even reads a word of it. Here are your guided lecture notes for today and what you'll need to know for the test. We'll be talking about paragraph organization, font choices, white space, and lists. These principles can be applied across just about every type of writing from emails, letters, reports, to proposals. First big concept here, people like to focus. In a 2008 article in the New Republic, the authors Kath um, Sunstein and Richard Thaley reported on how a cleaning manager at an airport in Amsterdam was assigned the task of reducing um, spillage around the urinals. So what did this manager do? Well, he had the image of a fly etched into the urinal bowls just to the left of the drain like you see in this picture. This resulted in an 80% reduction in spillage and in turn an 8% reduction in total bathroom cleaning costs. So as the authors of that study author article said, if you give a man a target, they can't help but aim at it. <laughs> so they expanded on this idea in their book Nudge by talking about how the role of the choice architect or the person who influences the choices other people make based on how we organize and display information. In document design, you as the writer become the choice architect. How we format and structure a document impacts what people choose to read. So when you're designing a document, think about your audience and what you want them to focus on. Let's connect this back to something we've already talked about, slide design. No matter what type of document, your job as the creator is to make it easier for the audience to understand what you're saying. So you know not to overwhelm them, to be concise, to think about how you can be clear and uh, to show them what's important. No matter what type of document, your job is just to make it easy. If there's something you want them to do, then you need to make it really clear and easy as possible for them to do it. Let's use this assignment that some of the upper level classes do. So that's the idea of an executive summary. <laughs> well, out of these three, which one do you want to read? You don't even know what the content says. The layout and the formatting of the document of one of these is going to make it look a whole lot more readable than the others. For most people, it's going to be that one, um, the third one, the one that says executive summary in blue text and is using numbers and bullet points. We'll discuss a lot of the strategies in play here. The list, the bullet points, the white space, the use of headings. But keep this example in mind. Your first impression of a document is its layout and that design gives you a gut feeling of the sense of the organization if you want to read it or not. Think about this as a student. If you are turning in a paper and it is in correct APA format and the professor has asked for APA format, that first impression is going to be, ooh, I think this might be an A. If you turn in a paper, doesn't have a name, doesn't have a title, doesn't have page numbers, doesn't have correct paragraphing or margins, professor, before even looking at the content, let's just be blunt, is probably a little worried about what's going to be in there. And if you want to play along, you can. Um, but before we get into document design, here's another variable for you to consider. So that's the idea of accessibility. So you can think about things you've had a tough time reading in class. Uh, so you sat at the back of the room and there's a PowerPoint slide with small font or a graph full of statistics is too small to read from even the first row. <laughs> so if you're like me and you're nearsighted, that means you might miss out on a good chunk of the information if you don't have you know, your glasses on. Well, what about red text on a green background? Christmassy, festive, but not if you're colorblind. That contrast might disappear on the slide or the page and become difficult, if not impossible, to read. We want all of our documents to meet the ADA, Americans with Disability Act requirements, so they're accessible with people with visual needs. Uh, so here's uh, what you can do to see if your document is accessible. Pause the video and take a minute to try these steps with one of your documents and see what you find. Here are some key points on document design now that you've done that. Let's get into some of the details on the key points. We're going to talk specifically about paragraphs, heading and emphasis, font, white space, and list. So let's get ready for a good time or as good a time as I think we can have with the topic. So here we go with paragraphs. Concise writing makes documents easier to read. Now concision or conciseness doesn't mean that you should remove needed information. Instead, it means omitting unnecessary words and phrases so readers can quickly get to the main idea. 
using this slide as an example, think about if instead I had said on each bullet point, you should control paragraph length and documents, you should have one idea per paragraph. Having even the just you should and a verb before each thing is going to make it a lot wordier. So in business writing, think about how you can make your language efficient. Readers generally, unless it's bad news, they want you to get to the point. A typical paragraph in business writing will be about 40 to 80 words or four to eight sentences. This is not academic writing. For routine documents like a reminder email to a department to RSVP, it's going to be shorter, like two or three sentences, maybe not even using traditional paragraphs, but a sentence per paragraph. Because we use short paragraphs, you want to try and keep it to one idea per paragraph. And some people go further and say you should have one idea per email. Uh, because once you start layering in multiple ideas, people tend to pick the one idea they want to respond to and ignore the others. You want to use short sentences. So in a study from the American Press Institute, they found that when the average sentence length in a piece was fewer than eight words long, readers understood 100% of the story. At 14 words, they're more like 90%, but a 43 word sentence, so maybe you've written a few of those in your, uh, let's say, history essay, comprehension drops below 10%, which is terrifying. That means you need to keep your sentences short because why are you writing in business? To get usually something done or to improve your relationship or to build or develop an idea. You don't want to write things that people cannot understand. That is not the goal here. That doesn't mean short sentences can't have variety. You just want to keep comprehension as a primary goal. Now in business writing, you'll generally see that paragraphs are single spaced, not double spaced, and they'll have a white line or a line inserted in between each paragraph. Because there is that use of white space, which we'll talk about in more detail, you don't need to indent your paragraphs. Um, indenting paragraphs actually wastes, um, you know, five spaces <laughs> or a certain a set amount, so maybe a half an inch, uh, if you think, big business here, if everybody's wasting a half an inch or an inch of where text could be per page, it adds up to things like printing costs within an office environment. So no need to indent, we're using other forms of white space. When you're doing letters, this is the one of the more common formats for business. This is called a block format for a business letter and it's a good example of what we just talked about in the last slide. Everything is left justified to give it a clean look. Paragraphs are single space and use white space for visual separation. Indentations, not needed. The use of space visually separates the paragraphs for us. Um, and this is gonna look like an email, right? All right, so take a moment to, moment to read this visual. Notice how the different size and weight of the fonts helps you navigate this document. That's because uh, you're using, in that last slide, ways, or the author did anyways, ways to guide the reader's eyes, or the viewer's eyes in this case. The different use of fonts, variations in typeface, arranging them in an order is going to create what we call a visual hierarchy. The hierarchy helps readers move through a document. A visual hierarchy indicates what's important in a document and makes the structure clear to readers. Heading titles help do this and aid the readers in skimming the document. When we're building a visual hierarchy, we want to use emphasis sparingly so that we don't distract the reader with too much going on. We want to be consistent in our usages throughout the document so we don't confuse the reader. You may have already noticed an example of visual hierarchy when working on your resume. Different parts of the document use different fonts or variations on the typeface to create a hierarchy or order to the document. To tell the reader what the big sections are and how they're organized within each section. Here we have the individual's name in the largest font in the title case, followed underneath by the title in a smaller font, still bold in all caps. The body is just the plain text of the same typeface. The size change and the weight leads you through the document. Right. Here's another chance to examine this idea of visual hierarchy. These two snippets of nonsense text say the same thing. Which of the two designs is easier to read? Which one's more likely to be read? Which one communicates effectively? The tags help create visual distinction when compared to unstyled text. You can clearly see that the stylist text is harder to comprehend. 
The image with typographical hierarchy is not only easier to scan, it's easier to look at the various elements to help guide your eye along the text. Here's another example of typographic hierarchy. In the first business card, font and size is all the same. In the second, variations in typeface, size, and color all direct your eye to focus on a particular area first. What about this one? Take a minute to pause the video, try to identify the major levels of headings. What is the highest level on the hierarchy? What does it look like? What's the next? And so on. Hopefully you come up with a hierarchy something like this. First, title, writing grant for proposals, largest, bold, title case. Second, subtitle, key areas, smaller but still bold and title case, underlined. Third, labels above the individual paragraphs, bold and title case. The learn more box in gray could be considered an inline heading. The fourth level for this document, bold and italic, not set above the rest of the text, but included in the same line with it. Here are some more examples of headings. Notice the parallelism here. They're all the combination of a gerund. That's an ing ending verbal noun. They're all two words. The consistency helps send a nonverbal message to the audience's brain and underscores the equal level of these three items. Let's look at this example. How would you interpret the all caps here? <laughs> uh, as you probably know, caps in sometimes is read as a yelling, sometimes people just figure it's more efficient. It's actually some organizations that require people to only type in all caps because it saves time because people are not taking the extra, you know, whatever part of a second to press the shift key. Uh, but generally we still see this as yelling. Here's a final example of emphasis. Using bolding strategically in an email can allow the reader to clearly see the call to action before moving on to the next email. If someone's moving quickly through their inbox, they might miss the action to RSVP if it wasn't bolded. Next, I want you to think about your font. It's another area that sends nonverbal messages in addition to the actual words illustrated by the font. Your font choices have a lot of implications, and I don't mean just the inadvisability of using wing dings for anything. The fonts that you pick send a nonverbal message. Here are some guidelines to consider. Keep consistent. No more than two typefaces in a document, but it is okay to sometimes have two. You want to pick a font that's available on the average computer. So many of the new online programs for slides, for documents, and that includes Google Docs, use fonts that are unique. Your really cool presentation is not going to look too awesome when you download it to PowerPoint on one of the big JSOM computers. You want to consider sans serif, uh, so Arial, for things like heading signs, material that doesn't have continuous reading. In particular, that means for something like a website, uh, that tends to be more appropriate. Serif fonts like Times New Romans uh, tend to be body fonts and much more appropriate for written documents uh, like an email or a letter opposed to a PowerPoint presentation. For written, present, written work, so not a PowerPoint presentation, but an email or a letter, you want to stick with 10 to 12 on the font size, which you are already used to. You can use different font sizes for emphasis, but generally, you're going to pick one strategy and consistently use it throughout the whole document. Now, next, let's talk about white space. Too little white space will equal information overload. Your slide, your document will look cluttered. They'll be confronted, um, you know, you'll, or you will confront the reader with what we call the wall of words. So you think of a page um, of a dictionary or an encyclopedia or maybe an academic journal article. It is not inviting. It is can be really imposing with wall to wall words and lack of places for your eyes to rest. Diana Vreeland, one of the most famous editors of Vogue, had a famous, famous dictum, uh, quote, the I must travel, unquote. So I think about that every time I'm talking about document design. It's equally as true for the visual appeal of documents as it is for clothing or your look. Too much white space can be almost as bad as too little. The document looks insufficient and unfinished. So what white space or is, or what is white space? How can you create it? Paragraphs, if they're short, if you're using headings, your lists, your margins are going to be appropriate. All of that's going to help people skim. With the margins, it's not going to be anything that you're not used to. We're going to stick generally with one um, inch, maybe an inch and a half. Here's the same words in a different design. 
This side-by-side, -side, I think, is an excellent comparison of how different formatting is going to tell you everything you need to know about white space and how it's so important. You want to read the one that's broken up, right? It looks more readable. It looks more organized. It was probably an extra 30 seconds of font changes, but it's going to make it look more finished. Next, let's talk about lists. They're great because they're going to allow readers to notice items, help the reader process information, aid in recall, and help create more white space. Now there's two ways that you might want to think about this. Um, either using a numbered or a bullet list. You use generally each one for a different purpose. Numbered list would be more sequential, so the number of steps in a recipe or how to submit something. A bulleted list typically would not have a particularly sequence to the items and puts them all at equal value. So one pet peeve here, you should not just have one bullet point or one item on a list. You need to make sure that if you're using this, you're consistent with it. I will tell you that I have coworkers where I sometimes will use numbered lists when I should be using a bulleted or vice versa, and it drives them crazy. So just understand, what are my audience's pet peeves? How can I make sure that I'm not getting them to focus on my use of numbers or bullet points? Instead, I want them to focus on the steps on how to make the coffee or the toast or whatever else. You also want to make sure that you're using a balanced or parallel construction when you're listing similar ideas. You've already done this with the resume. Uh, you just want to think about how you can be in accordance with the way the brain works. Our brains like parallelism. We like harmony. It's hardwired into us for survival of the species. It's just that studies have shown that we almost universally rate symmetrical things more attractive than those that aren't. And um, there's lots of research out there about that. So let's then look at this before version of a request email. So we talked about document design. So what are you noticing? Nah, it's, it's probably not super readable, right? Kind of blocky on the paragraphs. Um, if you wanted to pause here, you can make a couple of notes of what could be changed to improve it. Here's an update, and this is going to imply everything we've talked about back through chapter four and five. So <laughs> if you're serious about improving your message, think about the ways that that last one is improved into this one. There's bullet points. Uh, it makes more sense to use bullets than numbers. There's uh, going to be an equal value on each one. The email ends with an action item. The action item applies all of the 10 C's uh, where we have a call to action with a clear deadline. You could make it even clearer and it's positive. Uh, the first one, if you noticed on the language, was a little more negative, but this is much more readable, much more respondable. All right, so big takeaway from this lecture, design matters. It matters for big projects, for little ones, for routine messages, and just period for effective communication. Check out the parallelism in this bulleted list. Adjective, noun. That's now what you know to look for. And parallel lists might start to drive you mad. That's my little gift I hope to you from this lecture. Uh, but you really need to think about what can I do to make it easy for my reader to understand it? How can I work with the brain's natural process, which is what we've been talking about this whole semester with the other chapters. So let's do a quick review. We've talked about a lot today. Uh, so after doing the reading, watching the lecture, you hopefully have a greater understanding of how your written work communicates verbally as well as non-verbally. If nothing else, to emphasize this, let me repeat that main point that I made about turning in papers for classes. If your professor says the format of this document, the format of this table, the format of the slide should look like whatever they say, you want to be sure that you're living up to their expectations because just like with a resume, people make snap judgments and then you have to work extra hard to come back from them. That's not ideal. I mean, that's not the way we wish reading and analyzing worked, but we know that people can sometimes end up there. So you are the one who's responsible for implementing best practices in document design so that people don't think about your design. They're only thinking about your content.